All right, this is Tony Alamo again with tape number 11 in a series of 15 of adversity and how to be able to cope with it in these last hours of time. And this is really important because uh, a lot of people are preaching today that we're not going to be here when the great tribulations come and it's for sure some people will not because they're going to die between now and then. Many will fall asleep uh, and uh, many will get sick and fall asleep and they'll go out into eternity but it's for sure and certain that there's going to be a whole gang of us here uh, when Jesus comes back to earth, some of us will be changed to the twinkling of an eye and uh, many will be raised from the dead and, that, and we're definitely going to be going through the tribulations and the Lord wants us to go through some adversity here and some of us a lot uh, because he chastens them that he loves and he wants us to go through it because he wants to wear down self-sufficiency in us so that we're we become totally sufficient on him totally dependent on him because dependency on God complete and total dependency on the Lord is Christianity that's the essence of Christianity people that are not totally dependent on the Lord are not Christians and we have to grow up into the fullness of that now people today are trained to be self-sufficient and this is the essence of Satan when people say you know uh, think and grow rich be your own man uh, I did it my way and we're trained we're actually totally brainwashed by the world to do things and be self-sufficient but in the Bible we learn that God wants everyone to uh, get that worn off. He wants us to live uh, strictly to his code, his word. And that means total dependency on him. Dependency on the Lord doesn't mean that you don't do anything. As a matter of fact, what that means is that you pick up the word, you study it word by word, and live according to what it says. And that means you do exactly what the word of the Lord tells you to do. And uh, this particular tape in this series is we're going to call uh, the power of weakness. And that means weak, the weaker we ourselves come become, in other words, we get all that my way out of the picture, then the more powerful God becomes in our life. And God... Uh, is exalted greatly and he gets far more praise and adoration and people see God more when it's actually uh, an impossible situation and in the Bible you can see when God turned upturned Egypt he overturned it he did all the great and mighty miracles there and made it to where the people um, it was the strongest nation in the world and they actually um, saw that this was not by any man's doings but it was uh, God it wasn't Moses's doings but it was God and Moses was so frightened by God because he knew that he'd wind up in hell if he uh, was sufficient on himself of himself Moses was always uh, a self-willed type person and uh, a lot of other people in the Bible were self-willed until the spirit like the Apostle Paul but they learned through adversity and through being in a lot of different uh, places to where there would be no way that they could get out of their problems unless God made a move for them and the way the reason that the Lord does that is because Number one is I just was saying that it makes you totally dependent on God and then God can be strong in your life when that happens. And then also when you're in a position to where uh, you can't get out unless it is the Lord, then all the people that are seeing the adversity that you're going through become aware of his power. And to start out, uh, I thought that it would be very good to come up with 
an example of how God uses weakness to show his great power. So there is power in weakness and there is only power in our weakness. God loves to uh, show people how weak we are and how powerful he is. If we're going around just doing things our own way, then there will be no work of the Lord at all. None whatsoever. He can't show his power. He won't show his power. So we're going to start reading from 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 1, uh, 1 through 24. And this setup here is just a setup to show you what the scene is uh, with the Philistines and with uh, the psalmist David where... Um, there wouldn't be any great move of God, say, for instance, if King Saul, when he saw uh, uh, the uh, Goliath come out and start boasting how he was going to be the champion, the champion of champions and everything, if Saul put all of his armor on, because Saul was the tallest one of the Jews, and he went down there and just thrust Goliath through and cut his head off, there would be no power given at all to God, but there was a Jewish boy it said now remember a man what is uh, my wife is also Jewish and she's the one that's going to be reading these scriptures here a man in Jewish uh, in the Hebrew is what 12 years old 13 years old 13. What, 13 years old so when it says the shepherd boy in the scriptures here we're talking about it could be David it would be possibly anywhere from 8 9 10 11 or 12 years old it could be like a 10, 9, 10, 11, 12 year old boy. He's a shepherd boy. Went out there and did the job that nobody else in the entire camp uh, of Israel could do. Even Saul didn't want to go out. This tall, this big guy. So right here the uh, psalmist David went in and it showed in this scriptures uh, that this was the weakest and the most foolish thing in the world to think that a little boy could go out and that he had to be under 13 years old and we just don't know 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 for sure no more than 12 and he went out and killed Goliath and cut his head off and drug it and he stated that he's coming in the name of the Lord and it was definitely God that got the glory here and David knew it the entire camp of Israel knew it and uh, so in the weakness of a little boy God showed his power so let's go ahead and we'll set this up this uh, broadcast right now now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoho which belongeth to Judah and pitched between Shoho and Azekah in Ephes Damim and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah, and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had an helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. Now you wonder in the Bible, you know, why God is explaining all this, you know, because what God is trying to tell everybody is that this boy doesn't have, and no, nobody has the slightest chance for success in fighting this person. And that's every setup. I mean, when the, the whole Egyptian army is uh, after this bunch of peasants, this bunch of slaves, and they're at the Red Sea, they don't have the slightest chance. It's like God always likes to show the weakness of people. Uh, and uh, when Sennacherib came up against this handful of feeble, weak Jews, and his entire army of tens of thousands and there's just a handful of these Jews there 
and uh, uh, they were building this walls of Jerusalem and they just says oh god even a little fox jumping up on top of the rocks would knock the walls down that's how feeble everything was over there and yet uh, God destroyed uh, the Egyptian army opened up the Red Sea and this is God's when the odds are the greatest that's when God moves when the God when the odds are the greatest against his people I can uh, remember I mean there's just one case after the other in our ministry uh, that these this type of a thing happened where it was absolutely virtually 100% impossible for us to get out of situations and just when it would be that we'd be at the Red Sea and everybody had just uh, everybody in the government and everyone in churches all over the world would think that's the bitter end of that Alamo church uh, this is their end and thank God and that's when God would put down his hand and uh, then uh, his power would be shown and so also our self-sufficiency would be worn down to where we'd have to be totally dependent on the Lord and to and when a situation like that happens it shows God's sufficiency God's power and it teaches people to stop trusting in their own ways because all of man's ways are foolishness unto the Lord and he takes the foolish and the weak things of this world to confound those that think they're so wise and what and see God is setting these scriptures up here right here to show how sufficient this Goliath is now there is the essence of sufficiency coming up against God's people well there's never been anybody more sufficient than the United Nations man they're setting themselves up now as we are the power we are Goliath we are the greatest in the world and nobody better mess around with us and all you Christians were taking the Bible out of the schools in Israel you better comply with what we're saying and better sign the peace agreement or we're going to utterly destroy you and run you into the Red Sea we don't care what God said in the Old Testament or in the New Testament uh, we don't it doesn't make any difference what God says because he God is antiquated and we are Goliath and I have we have the weavers beam and we've got cubits going for us and we've got this brass target of the brass around our shoulders and all this is kind of armor and there's more of us than there is of you feeble Christians and oh God is setting the scene up in this world now for one of the most dynamic moves that you have ever seen mm -hmm. and the more we trust that the more we're going to be exalted ourselves because we're so weak in comparison to this great Goliath that God is going to be able to show his power I just went through a circumstance that it was virtually impossible for me to be here bringing this message here today and thank God that I was weak I'm the type and God always does this a lot of times with a person uh, that thinks they're so sufficient I've always been extremely sufficient in my life and God wants to wear that self-sufficiency of mine completely away to where I'm totally and 100 percent completely sufficient on God well a lot of that self-sufficiency went away when I saw him and I saw hell and I saw him pull the breath in and out of my body uh, that sort of takes the sufficiency self-sufficiency out of you because then you realize when your breath is in his hand that you better walk gingerly when he tells you to and when he tells you to sit down you better sit down and when he tells you to go you better go okay now that God is setting this scene up here for a little tiny a little in the guy he always says little David David was small but oh my is what they would say and he was a little boy many of you people out there might have a little girl or a little boy that's 10 years old we have a little girl that's 10 years old I can't even imagine her going out and saying I'm coming to you yeah this big Goliath 
in the name of the living God, and I'm going to sever your head, separate your head from your body, and I'm going to drag, leave your carcass here for the fowls of the air, and I'm going to throw your head and take it over and give it to the people of Israel and show them that you're dead, that you're nothing. And God says that the nations are as a drop in the bucket to him, and he says in the word of God, what is going to happen? You know, to the United Nations and to Rome, he said what's going to happen to uh, the people uh, that uh, raise themselves up against the Jews. And when God says something, that settles it. It's going to happen. It doesn't make any difference how uh, big or great people think they are and how hard they thump their chest. And God right now is putting Israel through some adversity. Hopefully that they'll get down on their knees and say, my God, we are not self-sufficient. If you ever saw a bunch of sufficient people in your life, take the Jews. Because, oh, they're saying, well, man, we went to Antibia and we did this and we did that. And we're the greatest army in the world. And maybe they are. Uh, they got a lot of heart. Uh, these people are God's chosen people. Uh, the Jews. And we are Jews. I'm a completed Jew. My wife is a completed Jew. There are many completed Jews here. And everyone that accepts the Lord Jesus Christ is a Jew, a spiritual Jew. It's not the Jew that's one outward, but it's the Jew that's one inward, the Bible says, the one that keeps the commandments of the Lord. And why should we keep the commandments of the Lord? Because we're all frail, we're all made out of the dirt of the ground, we're all flesh, and we're all going to come to the Red Sea in our life. And many of us have come many times, and we're not to get angry at God, to get mad at Him, or to get discouraged when we get to the Red Sea. Or when we see something happening to us to show us that, oh my God, we had no control over the sickness or the death of one of our loved ones. Now God's trying to show us that we don't have control. That because of the sin that came into this world, uh, we all have to die. And that's weakness. <clears throat> but uh, we are sown in weakness because of sin. You know, we come to the living God, to His Son Christ, through His Son Christ Jesus then power enters into our mortal body the spirit of the living god and we have the power then to conquer we've conquered death hell and the grave through the son of the most high god who showed us openly that he conquered death hell and the grave and so <clears throat> then we have the power uh, when we die uh, that you spend eternity in the kingdom of heaven uh, with the greatest amount of power in the world because it's god's power and he created the heavens and the world and he's the one that's causing uh, us to go through adversity on this side of eternity it's because of our sins and our self-sufficiency that the more self-sufficient you are the more God's going to intervene in your life because he loves you so much he died for you and he loves you so much that when he sees you going to hell that he's going to cause something in your life to happen to where you don't feel sufficient anymore because the circumstances that you find yourself in are so great that you know and you realize that you don't have the power to cope with it. You can't handle it. There has to be a move from the living God. And so you look into the Word of God because God says that He will not move for the uh, efficient. He will uh, in their own selves, but He uh, moves and walks and blesses and, uh, and He uh, assists all those that are dependent and totally dependent on his word, on him. And that's Christianity. So you read in the word of God and you say, oh, God says to do this. Well, but everyone says we can't and we shouldn't. But if I do that, God says that I, he will bless me at the time when I get to the Red Sea. And so I have to start doing what God says if I expect to get out of this. And we shouldn't wait until we get to the Red Sea to do that because we have to assume and have enough intelligence that this is going to happen to us sometime or the other in our life. It could be that we get up in the morning, brush our teeth, put on our shoes and socks, shirt and pants and whatever you're going to wear today, get in our car and we're going to get in a wreck. Or maybe you're going to experience a heart attack or you possibly could die. Or you could be getting close to death or, or you could see a death someplace or something could happen in your life. And it does to millions of people every day to where if you knew that you had been keeping God's commandments that there would be deliverance there. And in eternity, you never die. There's no sickness. There's no uh, pain. There's no death. There's nothing but happiness in the kingdom of heaven. And it's everlasting life.
And that's real power. And so we have to, in order to receive that power, lose all of our own sufficiency. We have to become weak so we can become strong. When, we're, when we die, our old ways die, and we take on and the personality of God, we take, uh, adopt his way of thinking in his mind, and we do only what he says to do. That's dependent on God. We depend that his word is true. We depend that his word is right. We depend that if we do what he says uh, in his word, that we're going to be delivered and that we're going to be blessed and uh, all the other things that I said. So here's the setup here in the word of God. <clears throat> of And God wants that he sets it up all the time so that we can see that this is how God moves for people is when they say, uh, I come in the name of the Lord. I don't come in my own name, my own sufficiency. I come in the sufficiency of God's. God's going to show his power, his sufficiency, that he's sufficient and that we're not. There's no way in the world that this little kid, it's impossible. The odds are too great. There's not even the slightest chance uh, for victory. There's not the slightest chance for success in a situation like this. And that's when God uh, is, uh, the he gets the greatest amount of glory. And that's what he wants. He does. He will not get any glory when somebody's thumping their chest. And that's what happened to this King Nebuchadnezzar. He was thumping his own chest and showing that he was the sufficient one. And so God put him to graze out with the cattle in the uh, woods, out in the field out there. And uh, then to show how smart he was, the only thing that he could be smart of then would be is that he could discern the difference between milkweed and Johnson grass and uh, dandelion greens and things like that. Well, he was really smart then, because he'd snuck his nose up at uh, the uh, weeds and so on, and he'd just only chew on his hands and knees on Johnson grass and lemongrass and the good stuff. See, that's what happens when uh, you're really smart, you know, and you're sufficient. Amen? Amen. You can tell which is the weeds, and which is grass. Amen? Amen. So do you want to get put in that position, you know, a great king? Or do you want to just let the Lord bless you so that you don't have to wind up in the in the weed and grass field eating grass like a cow? Okay, then go ahead, sweetheart. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. See, God just keeps building up the sufficiency, building up the sufficiency, because he's going to lower the boom here in a minute. Okay, then what? And one bearing a shield went Say, before oh, him. Sufficient. Oh, man, he even had somebody else to help him be sufficient. Okay, then what? And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine? And Am ye... I not sufficient? Okay, then what? And ye servants to Saul. And you a bunch of weakies. Okay, Israel, you're weak. Oh, you better read the Bible, people. Okay, yeah, they're weak. And better watch out for those weak ones because when they're weak and they rely on God, something's going to happen to you if you want to entangle yourself with them. Read the book of Zechariah and see what's going to happen to you. Your eyes inside the holes of your head and your tongue are going to be consumed and eaten out of them. People that trouble themselves with Israel in these last days. And that's talking about the believers in Christ. And so you Jews over there, if you want God to move for you, you better start uh, saying, uh, stop listening to those rabbis. Get down on your knees and say, God, uh, the rabbis are not the sufficient ones. You are. Your word says that the Messiah would be the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the root of Jesse, the, the lion from the tribe of Judah, and that he'd be born in Bethlehem of Judea, and that he'd die on the cross and shed his blood for the forgiveness of everyone's sins. The book of uh, Isaiah in the 53rd chapter, it wasn't some messianic era of time that God was talking about. It was a person he will grow up before us as a tender plant. <coughs> Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Uh, if you want to see a move of God, you better accept the Messiah. The Bible said he came here to die and that he would be meek and lowly, a man acquainted with grief and sorrow, and that he would be cut off for the sins of the world. And that happened, then it said he would come back again. 
and the signs and the time that he would be coming back to uh, again real soon the God is setting the earth up in that very manner it's like when everybody would be coming up against Israel and us Christians and the, uh, again the Bible says that Israel means uh, believers in God and if a person doesn't believe in the Messiah you don't believe in God because God sent his son here uh, which it was in his express his exact image and likeness to show us the things that God loves in a human being and that uh, he wasn't sufficient of himself he said my will is not to do my own will I'm not sufficient of myself but I only do I only say and I only, my meat is to do what my father tells me to do. And so therefore, uh, you'll see God move from me. When I pray, uh, you'll see the dead raised. When I pray, you'll see people uh, fall down on their knees if I tell them to. When they went to get Jesus to kill him, he said, Whom seekest thou? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And to show his power that they couldn't have taken him, that he truly laid his life down for the sins of the world. He said, I am he, and they all fell down on their backs. And this happened three times in a row. Mm -hmm. And so therefore he showed that he was the power because he wasn't sufficient of his own, that the power of God was with him. And the power of God would be with you people in Israel and will be with any of you people here in the United States or Canada or Africa or the Philippines or anywhere you are. When you lose your own sufficiency and you read in the Bible and do what he said, a lot of people tell me, don't be talking out against the Pope or the one world government or anything. All your problems are caused because of the fact you speak out against the uh, Antichrist. Now, if you just shut up, Tony, if you just keep your mouth shut, then you wouldn't have any troubles anymore. Yeah, I wouldn't have any more troubles with the one world government and the church, but then I wouldn't be delivered just like I recently was. Amen. I was delivered and there was no hope for deliverance whatsoever every government agency in the world was on my back I was in jail they took our property away from us uh, they took our property away from us they uh, destroyed our businesses and everything we were in our weakest form and here I was in jail three and a half months and I asked God I says God all right, I went and spoke against the one world government and the church, the great whore, and I told people what was going on and everything, and look where I am. I'm in jail now, and if you want me to stay here, fine, uh, but I just don't want to pray to get out if I'm not supposed to get out. Uh, Father, do you want me to stay in here? Because if I'm supposed to, I don't want to be out because something terrible could happen. I want to show your power. And so the Lord then spoke to me and says, uh, you're going to be out of here and I'm going to bless you. He says, you did what you did, now you watch my power. And we won this battle uh, with the judge. Uh, I was out uh, two days later. And we won, uh, won the battle with the Internal Revenue Service. And we won the battle. Uh, the judge t told us to go out and settle with the Department of Labor. And even the news media was saying, Good God, it's hard to believe that Tony Alamo was in jail just a couple of weeks ago. And look at him now. He's on a roll. Every battle he's come up against, he's winning. And the people that knew the situation that I was in says, my God, that's God. I mean, there's no way that that man could have got it. I had bail compounded against bail. There was no way I could even get out on bail. They bailed me out on one thing and I still was in jail. I won one case and I still was in jail. And then I got out and I'm out now. And praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. God showed his power in my weakness. Everyone saw how weak I was. Even as sufficient as I was before, I was totally weak. And look at this, I'm out. I'm talking on the air right now. And God will do the same for you if you trust and do everything he says. But he won't do it for the sufficient person. So therefore, you people must know that I'm not a self-sufficient person. That I did, or God doesn't deliver. He will not deliver. He will not bless the sufficient. Sufficiency is Satan. Inefficiency. Uh, or like weakness, uh, your own weakness, but uh, following God because you know he's strong, that's power. So there's power in weakness. And we have to stop now for station identification and we'll be right back. This is Tony Alamo, so stay tuned. Or weakness. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. God is not weak. And uh, 
all of the power of mankind is not as strong as God's weakness because he doesn't have any weakness at all maybe he does maybe he's weak because he loved us so much but to me that shows his power his resurrection and saving power and so we're going to uh, continue on in reading 1 Samuel 17 1 through 24 uh, my wife Sharon is reading and uh, uh, we're just showing that God is setting this scene up here for us and it isn't just a story this actually happened you know Israel still honors David because of this phenomenal thing that happened here and other phenomenal things that because of David's weakness God showed his power in him and uh, when things like that happen these are the uh, things that write into the minds of people and are rem uh, remembered forever and they're written in the Bible David only became not the apple of God's eye when uh, he lusted and then he became immoral and became a killer and then uh, God he became self-sufficient because God says don't be immoral and don't murder and uh, <clears throat> he did so he became self-sufficient because that pride entered in and pride is the root of sin and it didn't make any difference how great David thought he was he was only great in his weakness in his following the commandments of the Lord when he says I'm not going to pay attention to morality and I'm not going to pay any attention to the commandments of God thou shalt not commit adultery thou shalt not commit murder I'm going to do it so then he pride uh, because of the fact that he, he was exalted so much in Israel ended in there was a shift in his personality a slight shift that's all it takes is a slight shift when people start praising you for the move the power that God moved in your life and I'm experiencing some of that right now where people are saying oh my god Tony Alamo is doing all this you could hear the media say Alamo is on the roll now <clears throat> he's doing this and he's doing that but you want to know something I I remember that it wasn't Alamo that did it Alamo was in a position to where he couldn't do anything at all and it was God that delivered me and it doesn't make any difference how much the people of this world say Tony Alamo is something I only might be something because uh, in God it's his power that delivered me and it's he wore down that self-sufficiency in me because I know I had to totally depend on him to get me out and I had no idea the government said if anyone put up property to bail me out that they would seize it because they would automatically assume that it was my ultra ego and it belonged to them so no one associated with the church could even put the money up to get me out and then the night uh, uh, then there was a time that came that uh, Bob Cole he was a bail bondsman in Fort Smith and uh, I was telling him about how God spoke to me one time and he says you know Tony I wouldn't say this if you hadn't have said that God actually talks to people and he said God never talked to me before in my life but he says one night I was dead sound asleep and I woke up my eyes just popped open and I didn't know why and he says I rose up and I heard a voice say get Tony out of jail and he says I knew because of the intelligence that was in that room what Tony it was it was you and uh, he's unsaved he, he says he doesn't want anybody to think that he is saved or any part of our church and he wasn't and he put up his business and his home and he talked to other people to put their businesses up in their homes God talked to him and put it and he said there was like a, a spirit that just moved me to do it and I could work day and night day and night tirelessly to do that and uh, I couldn't stop to do it and he said you know Tony I have never and nor would I ever do this for my brothers my own three brothers I would not do that for anybody in this world and I would not if it wasn't for this voice I would not have done it for you but this voice will and my wife got the same spirit she just felt to do it and we're both unsaved and to me 
I didn't know how God could possibly get me out of there, but I know he's God. And I said, God, I'm not going to try to tell you how to get me out. If I'm supposed to, you said I was going to, and I believe you will. And it's by faith that I'm saved. It's faith that I'm healed. It's faith that I'm delivered. And so I'm going to believe in your deliverance. There was a man uh, that called up and he was in jail and it cost a hundred dollars. And I instructed, I thought, well, I've got to have money for my own bond. And the Lord says, go ahead and uh, tell the brothers and sisters to put the money up for this man's bail, a brand new baby Christian that was in Atlanta, Georgia. And Sil Primo's called uh, over there to jail and asked if they could have the money for it. And I thought, man, how come they're not saving money for me to get out? How can they possibly want? And the Lord says, do it. He spoke to me again and I says, do it. <laughs> Because if I'm out, well, then there'll be more finances and more people get, people get bailed. Well, they went over there to bail the guy out, and they, there was a soul saved over there. Uh, somebody that was sick and about ready to die got saved. And all kinds of supernatural things happened because I listened to what the Lord said. And you know, when you, in this world, as frail as we are, and as weak as all of us are on this earth, uh, it doesn't matter if you brainwash yourself into thinking that you're a Goliath, or you might have made a couple of million bucks or a hundred million or a billion dollars. You might be the president of the United States. The more that uh, you have gained in this world and the more sufficient that you are, you know, Pharaoh is a big shot too. But you got to remember that you're frail and you're going to die one of these days. And you're going to come to grips with the Grim Reaper and you're going to go out, no matter whether you like it or not, you're going to meet God. You're going to stand before the judgment bar of God. And when you do, you're not going to be sufficient. Then it doesn't make any difference how much money you uh, come into the, uh, you have uh, or how powerful you think you are. We're all weak. We all have to die. And so you came into this world naked and without any money in your hand. Maybe your parents had money, but you came in busted and you're going to go out busted flat. And you're going to go out before God, whether you like it or not. And if you were self-sufficient and you didn't care anything about his work and his uh, sufficiency for deliverance and to deliver from hell and into the kingdom of heaven, well, I'm, there's you know, just no hope for you. And why do we preachers preach these things? Because woe be unto us if we preach not this true gospel. And God, if you read his word, you'll see one set up after the other to where the people were completely helpless there was no way they could get out of the situation and somehow god woke and unsaved somebody out or took a, a roaring sea and weakened it and opened it up and let the people go through or uh, uh the pile of rocks that were being built into the wall of jerusalem something happened where god the the angel from god came god didn't even do it himself he just sent one of his angels to do it and snuffed uh, thousands and thousands of men to where the, the Jews went up and wondered where are they and where's the adversary where's all this adversity we prayed and trusted in God and the adversity is gone we couldn't have done it ourselves but there it is it's gone they're all laying out there they're dead and Sennacherib took off and ran away and went to his own country and his own son went in and killed him hmm? his own kin did it how does this happen? Oh, you don't tell God how to do it, to kill people and so on. I don't believe that there was one person killed with my deliverance recently, but there wasn't anything that they could do. When God delivers, he shuts the lion's mouth with Daniel. The adversity were the lions. Uh, he makes the oven, the fiery furnace, to where it doesn't burn you. Uh, God does all this. We can't, and we know that we're going to have adversity. A sick mother, maybe a son that you love very much. Have you been coming up against the house of the living God? Sally Jesse Raphael did with me. And uh, something happened to her son and something happened to her daughter. We don't rejoice at this. What we look at is that God is trying to show her that she's not sufficient. There's nothing that she can do to stop the Lord from taking this person's life. Did the Lord take this person? Yes, he did. And he's going to take your life too. 
You mean to say God's causing all... He loves, you know, people shouldn't get angry at God, they shouldn't get mad at Him, or they shouldn't get discouraged because He's trying to wear your self-sufficiency down so that you'll show His, He wants to show His sufficiency because if you don't keep the commandments of the living God, if you are not totally sufficient on His word, there's no way that you're going to get into the kingdom of heaven. And He cannot show His power, and He will not share His power and glory. He won't show, uh, share His glory with anyone. He wants the glory out of it. And why? Not because he wants glory so uh, for glory's sake, but he wants the glory so people will turn to this glorious, powerful God to the point to where they realize that they're not sufficient of themselves, that he is all sufficient for salvation and for deliverance and to, re to get you out of the pit of hell and to get you into the kingdom of heaven where you're going to live there forever. He wants people to know that, and that is a glorious God. Uh, he figures and he knows that the, the, the chastisement or the adversity that you're going through right now hurts and stings for a while, but when you weigh it out with the final results of eternal glory and no death any longer, no pain, no sickness, no disease, no more relatives dying, no more death, and to just be happy forevermore. The little bit of adversity that we go through and the spanking that he has to give us and the lessons that he has to teach us will seem very mild in comparison to if you'll just give, say, uh, something happened today to me that was just horrible, uh, but it must be the Lord. It's got, it is the Lord. It's definitely the Lord. He's teaching me a lesson and we examine our souls. And we look at our souls and say, what is it, Lord, that you're trying to work out? Am I becoming too sufficient? Am I a do-it-yourself kit? Am I uh, doing something here on my own that you don't want me to do? Then you run into the Word and stay in there and just start doing everything that He says. And you'll see that deliverance will come. But if you keep fighting the house of God, if you keep fighting God's chosen people, and that, that is not... This is the Jew, the born-again Christian. This is God's chosen people. He says, those that come unto me, I'll come unto you. Those that turn their back on me, I'll turn my back on you. And Israel, he put, he's allowing the $6 billion or whatever it was to be yanked from you. He's uh, showing you that you're being compassed round and about by every enemy in the world. And that the big powers, this is all coming from Rome. But no matter where it would be coming from, get uh, to God. And the only way the Bible says, you know, the Old and New Testament says that you can get to God is through His Son, the Messiah. And if you ignore the 330 some odd uh, uh, scriptures in the Bible regarding the exactness of who the Messiah is, if you keep ignoring that, even to the point of the day that the Messiah was born, and the day that he died. Do you know that Jesus of Nazareth was born on the exact day that the old prophet Daniel said he would be born? And he died on the exact day that the old prophet Daniel said he would be born? Anybody else would be born before or after is a phony. If you're still waiting for the Messiah, forget about it. He was born the exact day that the prophet Daniel said that he would be born, and that was around 2,000 years ago. And he died the exact day. And so there's no possibility that there's another Messiah coming He's uh, to uh, save the world except the Messiah that's coming back to earth again. And the Bible states that the things that are happening to you right now would be happening to you just before he comes back to earth again. And he said that the Pope would be setting himself up in Israel, that he's God, just before he comes back to earth again. Tony, haven't you learned a lesson? Aren't you going to learn to stop saying things about the Pope? No, I'm not, because, you know, I'm relying totally on God to deliver me. I have to do what he says if I want to get delivered from the next uh, adversity that comes up. And so I have to keep telling, uh, see, I'm not afraid of man. Because that's not the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the fear of the Lord is wisdom. And so I'd rather be wise than stupid. Okay? Now, eventually we're going to get to the, the end of these scriptures here uh, that my wife is reading. But I just had to uh, set this up with you also in case, you know, you're a busy person and in your sufficiency. And um, so... Let's uh, start reading. If you're uh, so busy with your sufficiency that you can't listen to the Word of God, then 
do it before God starts cutting you down or cutting some of your family down to where he's going to make your heart break into a million pieces. It's better to do it from just wiseness uh, or from the fear of God that he might do something to you. And it's not that he might, he will. Why? Because he loves you. He chastens them that he, uh, whom he loves. And uh, he, the Bible says that you're illegitimate children. Illegitimate children if there's no chastisement, if there's no adversity in your life. Your own father and mother spanked you and did things to you like that and cut you off because they loved you and they didn't want to see you getting gangs on narcotics and drugs and things. And how much more our Heavenly Father. He died for us. His son, he sent his son to die for us. He loved us so much. And so you know that after we are saved, he loves us even all the more. Uh, and so he doesn't, when he sees this going on in our own sufficiency, he wants to show us that that isn't the way. That isn't the way. You got to get right. And how do you get right? You open up and please, only the King James Version of the Bible. There is no other version that's of any value except the original Hebrew uh, and the Aramaic and the Hellenic Greek, which is the Greek written and spoken by the Jews. So please only read the old King James Version of the Bible because there are no twists or turns and you won't get tripped up that way. Whether it's easy on you, see God doesn't want us to live a life of ease and um, self uh, indulgence and things like that. That isn't the best thing for us. That's why Jesus denied himself that's why God got the Israelis out onto the, delivered them from Egypt and took them from that. Even though they were oppressed, they had uh, all the different things to eat. And he took them out onto the desert so that their flesh would be crucified, so that there would be self-denial, so that there would be sufficiency on the living God. God could have fed them all the meat and potatoes that he wanted, but he didn't want them to have that. He wanted them to have a, a life of self-denial and to deny their self-sufficiency and to be totally and completely sufficient on God. And when they did, they wiped out every nation there was. And they went through the Red Sea. And the main, the bottom line, the big picture is to get into heaven and whatever it takes. Let's praise and thank God. Don't be angry at him. Shake your fist at him like the Bible says that you people are going to do. A lot of people are going to do. Don't do that. That won't do any good. No one can fight God. No one can fight anyone that can take the breath out of your body. No one can fight anybody that could uh, open up the Red Sea and then drown an entire world's strongest army. No one can um, fight the person uh, that made the heavens and the earth and the fullness thereof and made us out of the dirt of the ground and blew his breath into us and saved us and made the only way of escape out of this world. And you better read the Word of God to find out what that way of escape is. And it is not through our own efficiency. It's through the efficiency of the living God. Now here's just one of the many parables in the Bible that tells of uh, how a little boy, completely uh, impossible for him uh, to have success. But with God, he was extremely successful and is remembered as being the, mo uh, the most successful of Israel with the exception of the Lord Jesus Christ and some of the other prophets. Okay, then what? Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. I defy God's chosen people. And that's what people are doing today. That's what the one world government and church, the president of the United States is doing, the Pope. You're defying God's chosen people. And I got news for you. I wouldn't be in your shoes for all the money in the world and for all the gold and diamonds and rubies and anything. If I was given the world, I wouldn't be in your shoes. How can you be so stupid? Okay, just read the word and see what happened to other guys that thought they were hot stuff. Anytime that you think you're so self-sufficient that the world can't do without you, take a walk in the graveyard. Those guys were hot shots at one time too and we're still getting along without them, aren't we? You're in trouble, baby.
Okay, then what? I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Why? Because they knew they were weak. Okay, then what? Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. And the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab the firstborn, and the next unto him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. David the youngest. Okay, keep going. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. The shepherd boy. Then go ahead. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself forty days. And Jesse said unto David his son, Forty days out there saying, I defy God's army. I defy God's army. I defy God's army. Forty days. Wouldn't you get ticked off? Okay, go ahead. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn. And, and you know the, the United Nations are you saying the same thing, and they've been saying it more than forty days. And it's just brainwashing everybody into thinking that they're the greatest in the whole world and that there's no chance for any of us. Read the Word of God so that you can have God's sufficiency in your life. Read the Word of God so you can have great confidence as this little shepherd boy did. I don't feel weak at all. I know I've got a smile on my face because I know I'm weak, but I know I'm powerful when I have this weakness. Why? Because God will move for me. And you better watch out, UN. You better watch out, Bush. God's going to make a move for me. One of the Secret Service men told me, how do you expect to get through 50,000 uh, Secret Service men? Well, I don't expect to get, I'm not, I'm not even thinking about doing such a thing. I'm just warning everybody in the world that God can go through 50,000 Secret Service men very quickly. What he does is go right into the bedchamber, right through the walls. There's an amount of secret service men that can guard uh, uh, from the angel of death, from the grim reaper. Why, he comes down the halls invisibly in the White House or wherever you're at, in your room. He goes right through the walls or down the corridors, and then he finds somehow he knows God exactly what room you're sleeping in and what bed you are in. And he moves right into that bedroom where you are, and the Secret Service men are standing there in front of the White House with the machine guns and with 45s and magnums and everything, and they're just standing there and with their stance of defiance. Who could possibly get to anybody in uh, this world? God went into all the firstborn of Egypt and there was a uh, there was a Pharaoh that didn't believe that that could happen and yet there was a mourning that went out oh my god the weeping that went on in that uh, country that night how did he get into the bedrooms the grim, grim reaper when Pharaoh the greatest of all would was sta in his stance his own son got taken and uh, he could have taken Pharaoh, but he wanted Pharaoh to see the utter dis destruction and annihilation. He might leave you around before he takes you out to just show the complete annihilation of everything you have. Okay, go ahead. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn, and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to thy brethren. And carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand, and look how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning, and left the sheep with a keeper, and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight, and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage, and ran unto the army, and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up 
the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. Okay, so that's the setup. And David saw it. And then what's the next verse? And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that this that is come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. Okay, let's skip over now to verse 37. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And there was no doubt at all. How is it? Because David read the Bible all the time and he had other adversities in his life. He says that God delivered him out of them. What? From other people. Read that verse again. The Lord that delivered me out from of other the adversity, paw. rather, from the paw of the lion. He had a lion go after him one time, and he, as a little, maybe seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven-year-old boy, knew that there was no way that he could possibly get away from a lion. It had to be God get him out of the paw of the lion, right? Right. Okay. He delivered him from the paw of the lion, and what else? And out of the paw of the bear. There was a bear, that uh, an adversity that came up to David's life. See, a little boy isn't filled for a I did it my way type thing. They had, they know better than that because they, they're just as weak and as foolish as you can possibly believe when it comes to adversity. There's no possible way that you can be delivered. All right, so God uh, gets more and far more attention and far more glory when he works through people that are considered to be weak in this world because you know this world is you'd see a move of God from the person that you would least think just when you think Tony Alamo is finished pay strict attention get real Watch the news real close because you're going to see a shift just when you think. And I've had uh, down through the years, this has happened to us hundreds of times, and uh, a lot of people have noticed it. There was a couple of men that came into my cell in the jail and said, we just want to come in and shake your hand because we've never seen anybody get so much adversity, and you have the tenacity. And I said, oh, no, it's just God. I just trust God. That's it. Okay, now we go to 1 Corinthians 1, 20, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 1st chapter, 27th verse 29. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not, to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. All right, this is what the entire message is about. And so make sure that you read uh, that chapter and also the whole book would do very good. Now, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. All right, well, total dependency on the Lord. Uh, it becomes second nature to you. It builds up faith. When you see God delivering you time after time after time, like he did the Apostle Paul, then he could glory in all of his infirmities. Read verse uh, 10 again. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. You take pleasure in infirmities after you see that what that does, adversity keeps wearing down your own sufficiency so that God gets the glory. Then you see uh, real power coming into your life. Uh, the Apostle Paul could not be considered weak by any stretch of the imagination. He planted all the churches in Asia and along the sea. He trained the first pastors. 
He trained the first ministers and he taught the congregations what to do. He wrote uh, over one half of the New Testament, the Bible, one half of the, uh, more than one half of the New Testament Bible. Okay, so read that again, the 10th verse. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. This is Tony Alamo. Praise the Lord. See you next time.